You know, I, I was a journalist for over 30 years, and uh, it was always easier to interview people and ask tough questions when I, when I had disagreements with them. I don't have any disagreements with you, which makes it a little tougher. I was so impressed by, by this book and, and bowled, bowled away by it, and it, it, it's very timely. We live in very difficult times, and perhaps there are some things in your book that will help some of us to figure out what we should do about that. Um, why don't I start? I, I want to get into some things because we have a lot of public diplomacy and, and broadcasting people, in the, and I'd like to talk some of those issues. But why don't I start with something more, a little more topical? You've been looking at the sweep of history with a historical a historian's mind uh, and how that applies to where we are now. Well, OK, let's look at where we are now. Why don't I just ask you the very blunt question? Um, because I know that you, um, uh, and a lot of people know your background, your biography, kind of the positions you've taken over time. Um, what would it take? What would there's two more years of the Trump administration? What would the Trump administration? Yeah, at least, <laughs> at least, right? Uh, in the next two years, before the 2020 election, what would he have to do to get your vote? <laughs> oh, in foreign policy, in foreign policy. I really can't. Or, there was or is it, nothing he or is it could do that would get my vote. It's <laughs> absolutely nothing, it's I'm afraid. Too, it, it's too late. It, no, no, no. I, uh, I, he's a very special president, and, uh, and I, no, that's, that's not one of the options. Now, it is, if you put the question differently, which is what could he do in foreign policy that would make me happier than what he's doing now? Okay. Uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, on the surface, there are some aspects of his foreign policy. People are always waiting for him to get us into some nuclear war or something. I don't think that's what he wants to do at all, actually. I don't think uh, his base does not actually support intervention even. So I don't think this idea that he's a, he's a mad bomber, I think, is mistaken. And I think as, as we watch him deal with a problem like North Korea, um, we don't really, aside from the crazy gyrations of his you know, on the one, one minute it's fire and fury, the next minute he's my best friend, all that kind of stuff. We're not actually getting a different foreign policy. And you can probably look at a lot of areas of the world where in a very sort of tactical, on the ground sense, we're not getting anything that's very new. However, um, and especially in uh, the, the continent that I know best, which is Europe, um, he really is contributing to the breakdown of Europe uh, in a very uh, dangerous way because I think neither he nor most Americans who don't care that he's doing this understand what it means to us if, 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 if liberal Europe collapses, which I think it's in danger of doing. He is actively supporting uh, the forces against liberalism in Europe. He is pro Viktor Orban in Hungary. He's in favor of the Law and Justice Party in Poland. He is in favor of Marine Le Pen uh, in France. He likes the Italian government. He, and, and this is something that, that distinguishes him from every American president since the end of the Second World War, who have preferred one side of the center right or the center left. But these are the people who are actively working to undermine Europe. So if you ask me what could he do, he could stop doing that. But yeah. you know, there, there are reasons why he does that. There are reasons why that's his worldview. And so it's very hard for me uh, to imagine, you know, he would have to be a different person in order to, yeah. to yeah. have a different foreign policy. You, you say in the book, um, The Jungle is Growing Back, that <coughs> Americans over the past two decades have become convinced that the United States is doing too much, while actually it's been doing too little. Um, what should have been done and what should be done now if we're to keep the liberal world order uh, for our children? Well, in, in, the, in the broadest sense, we have to uh, go back to understanding um, that there are, uh, in addition to the obvious threats that we, we can think about every day, like China or, or, or Russia or nuclear proliferation, uh, and not to mention climate change, um, there are also all the things that, that go on in the world every day that for 70 years, uh, American diplomats have worked on uh, to try to prevent things from spinning out of control. And we were talking before, but we have a perfect example before us right now in the burgeoning conflict between India and Pakistan. 
I mean, the India-Pakistan problem is, an, is a, it goes back to the, the partition and has been with us for a long time. And it's, and it's always been a Central American role to be the kind of buffer between those two countries and to try to slow them down and not let them, uh, you know, escalate to dangerous levels, especially when they've become two nuclear powers. And you can multiply that role times times 50 or 100. There are these things go on. American the American public doesn't even know that this is happening because diplomats do these things quietly. But uh, we just lose sight of the fact that in every way in large ways and small the United States has a generally, I say generally, pacifying effect on many crises around the world and we have clearly stepped away from that now and it's dangerous. Yeah. You know, I, 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 on Wednesday night, I was I was thinking about what to ask you, and and what and sampling media as I as I as I do, and I watched about a half hour of Rachel Maddow on MSNBC and another half hour of Hannity on on Fox. Well, you're a, uh, uh, you're a tough guy. Gotten for punishment, <laughs> uh, and, and of course these are parallel universes, yeah. and it's as if it's a different. These are not the same country almost. Um, it's such a contrast with the era when I was a foreign correspondent for the major networks and and. Peter Jennings and Dan Rather and Tom Brokaw were competing, and most of the country watched one of those shows. And there were different presentations and different styles and different this and that, and different maybe sometimes implications suggested as to what to deal with, how to deal with foreign policy issues. But there were no differences over what the facts were. No. Three shows, one set of facts. No. Um, now we don't have that. And furthermore, after I finished grazing through Hannity and Maddow, I went upstairs and listened to the radio a little bit, and uh, uh, a little CNN, and then I went to the BBC. On CNN, they were doing nothing but prepping uh, Michael Cohen's testimony. Nothing. A quick mention that Trump was in North Korea. Um, and, and then on the BBC, it was all India and Pakistan and nothing else. And, well... I mean, I, I, I guess what I want to ask you is, do, how much responsibility do you think the media bears for the uh, increasingly isolationist atmosphere in America? I mean, the big story, old-style journalism would say, was India and Pakistan. No. Never mind that Trump's in, in North Korea. Nothing's happened yet. No. Michael Cohen hasn't spoken yet. Why are we talking about this stuff? It isn't news yet. <laughs> news is what's happened. There have been bombings. There have been planes shot out of the sky from one nuclear power and another. Our new media here wasn't even reporting it. No. I mean, a part of me feels like it, what's hard to do, as you know, is separate the way things have actually always been, except for a certain period that we think of as being normal, but was actually the aberration, yeah. from what's actually new. I think the idea, first of all, that Americans would be fundamentally uninterested in what's happening around the world is, in a way, our tradition. I mean, we've been able for most of our history not to feel like we had to think about any of these things. It, we didn't think it was our responsibility. Uh, I'm sure that if you looked at, you know, the popular media uh, in the 1920s or even in the 1900s, insofar as whatever that was at the time, they also were not worried about all the crises around the world. So to some extent, and this is unfortunately, from my point of view, bad news, Americans are just returning to normal. Mm -hmm. um, because we we actually were in an abnormal phase, and I would and I wonder whether even the media was in an abnormal phase uh, from I don't know where you want to pick the 1950s uh, through whenever you want to pick the ending was because you know even in it was never as bad uh, before as it is right now, but there were Democratic newspapers and Republican newspapers and Socialist newspapers and Shockmanite. You know, if you were in New York, there were 15 different brands of socialism <laughs> newspapers. Yeah. I don't think they made up different facts, but everybody knew they were spinning it in their own way. And I, I, what I can't tell, and you would have a much better grasp on this than I do, is what is the effect of the new social media uh, and the new and the, the, what effect has the internet had? And it's certainly the case that. Um, you know, to get eyeballs, you need to be uh, as extreme as possible, as opinionated as possible, and maybe even as fact-free as possible. Some would say that's what the Hearst newspapers were uh, in the 1890s. So what I can tell is, and I, you know, as an old as an old fogey, I, I I generally would think everything is getting worse because that's just what we 
old fogies think. I have to guard myself and say, you know, maybe, maybe it was never that great, and what is actually new? And I don't know the answer. You may have an answer on that. Well, let's, let's stay on social media for a minute, because uh, it, it obviously there's a digital communications revolution. We're, at the, we're maybe at the beginning of it. I don't know. Uh, but it's utterly changing the way human beings communicate with each other. And that may be why the liberal world order is in trouble. May it not? Um, uh, yep. You know, it, it, it does mean, however, that any one of us can take our phone and go film pictures and become a reporter. And, and uh, if it's compelling enough, the whole world will see it. So it's exciting right. in some ways, but it does seem to be part of why sort of trusted voices aren't trusted anymore and, and the whole system by which people used to gather information has, well, it's in flux, let's put it that way. Yeah. And of course, uh, when you have uh, people who are competing in the what is truth, who are deliberately not telling the truth, uh, as, you, as we obviously do, there are, it's not just people not getting to the truth necessarily, but they're deliberately spreading things that are not true, and, how to, and people have a hard time evaluating what is what. I think that's a little new. Um, but, uh, and, I, and I don't know what the solution to that is necessarily. And we clearly not only have foreign governments doing it, but even within our own societies, you know, people are, people are doing these things. And we, uh, we have not figured out the way to do it. You know, sometimes, I'm sorry, again, the historian in me gets in the way sometimes. But sometimes I feel like we've just gone back to the way the world was really throughout, throughout most of history. You know, if you were in Medici, Florence, there was no place to go for the news. Everything was rumor and innuendo, and somebody gave birth to an out-of-wedlock child, and somebody got killed in the cathedral, and you didn't know what the truth was. And that is kind of the norm of human existence. The problem is, I don't know how compatible that is with liberal, <laughs> as you say, with liberal democracy and a liberal world order. Uh, but uh, again, we sometimes take for, uh, we take for granted what may have been a kind of bubble uh, of history that we're moving out of again. Yeah. Be thinking of your questions, because I'm going to ask one more, and then I'm going to come to the rest of you. Uh, you in your book, uh, I think this audience might be interested on this, you, you, you talk about uh, the importance of hard power, <laughs> and that, that in the end, it's Article 5 of uh, NATO. That's what matters, right? Um, and and uh, but 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 a lot of us have worked in in the soft power world, so talk about the soft power world. Does it matter? Does it not matter? Where? How does it fit in your constellation and your sense of history? Well, I you know I I never loved soft power, hard power, but but I know what you're getting at, and I'll I'll, I'll address it in, in my own way, which is that I do think now we are engaged in, as I as I kind of alluded to uh, uh, earlier. We're engaged in a, in a battle of ideas. Right. Uh, we are not used to thinking of that. We really did think that the battle of ideas was communism versus democracy or liberalism. But we're engaged in a battle of ideas now with, uh, with, with, with opponents of liberalism and opponents who are not hiding it. They're proud of it. Viktor Orban says, I'm an opponent of liberalism. I want something called Christian democracy, which is not liberal. It's supporting Christian white culture. Uh, and there are Americans who want that as well. And I think one of the things that we have stopped doing, and this gets to some of our earlier conversation about the old USIA, you know, the US Information Agency, a lot of the things that, that, that people like, like him awesome. were thinking of very much after World War II, which is, are we going to defend the liberal idea anymore? Um, because right now, I think liberalism, and I'm, I'm using this word, you know, it's a tricky word to use these days, but by liberalism, I don't mean left or right. I mean, I mean the small, sort of bedrock, small, L. small L liberalism. Enlightenment. It, it's real, right. It's really under assault from both left and right right now, I think, but, <coughs> but very much from the right. Um, and I unfortunately, you know, I think that you wouldn't have had to tell anybody in 1948, let's say, that we really need to get out there and make the case for liberalism, which means individual rights, freedom of the press, free speech, you know, treating people equally, respecting people's rights. We just don't talk about that as much as, as we, I think, need to because we haven't taken seriously the challenge. I, I, I think that's, that's our primary soft power challenge right now. How worried are you? 
I'm worried because I think that, you know, there are two things that concern me. One is that, as I, as I say, I'm not sure even in the home of Enlightenment liberalism that we are, that we have a majority of people who would say they support <laughs> Enlightenment liberalism. I mean, that may be too strong, but I certainly worry about it. But the other thing I worry about is this technological uh, situation and, you know, the ability now of authoritarian governments like China to create a, a surveillance state and to use social media not only to know where everybody is, what everybody's saying, who they're saying it to, what they're buying, where they're traveling, but also to be able to censor what they, what they read and hear and also to shape what they read and hear. This is a tool of social control that Orwell couldn't have imagined. You don't need the boot in the face. You have Twitter and Google and Facebook. Um, and I worry that the, what, what I would call the sort of surveillance state sector of the world is growing and the protected sector where individual rights against the state are still protected is shrinking. Yeah. Now, we have a microphone, I think, and a person to take it to people who would like to start. A uh, gentleman in the blue in the middle. Yeah, pass it over, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Steele. Thank you, Dr. Kagan. So to borrow your analogy, um, my sense is that uh, edu that education is the best fertilizer for the uh, garden of liberalism, the liberal wor world order. Do you agree? And if there's something we can do, if you do, what can we do to make things better, to improve our educational systems? Can we just know who you are as well? We I'm Jim Wilson. Thank you. I feel like there must be some students saying, yes, education is a great fertilizer. Um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Uh, but, uh, no, I, I, well, I mean, you know, uh, I come from a family of educators, and, uh, but I also feel very much that uh, I have to believe that part of our problem is, 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 a, is an educational failing. Um, I'm a historian, so that's my prejudice, but I feel that people don't know enough history anymore. Um, and I also feel that, you know, in a way, and I, uh, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not hostile to academia. I, I, I grew up in academia, but I think, um, in a way, when it comes to the American history, uh, the academy has been so eager to point out all the contradictions and failings uh, of American foreign policy and American domestic policy, and all of those things are absolutely there to be found. But in a way, we, and I'm not talking about, I don't want flag waving, waving patriotic history, but I think we have in a way lost sight of, of, of how unusual this, as I say, how unusual this period has been. And that requires historical perspective. That means not only knowing what American life has been like, it means knowing what European life was like in the 19th century. It means knowing what life was like in the 16th century. You know, we, we forget about sort of, we think of traditional society as being devoid of ideology and people were kind of left alone working their farms, but that was a, that was a, a century of totalitarianism. And, and so therefore, we, we don't see liberalism as opposed to everything that came before and what the alternatives are. So there, I mean, at least, and I'm sure in many other ways we could point to education, the needs of education, but in that particular respect, the ability to make intelligent historical comparisons I think is very much lacking right now um, in our populace in general. And to recognize facts. Pardon? And to recognize a single set of facts. Well, as a, again, unfortunately, as a historian and academic, I know that facts are a contested issue as well. But uh, I don't mind the, con the contest. But I do, I, again, I wouldn't mind if people had alternative understandings of history if they had some understanding of history. <laughs> <laughs> Take another question. Uh, gentleman right here in green in the middle. This has his hand up. Yeah, oh yeah, Ken Meyer Court. Uh, do you uh, still believe that the 21st century is the new American century? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? <laughs> 
we, lo we lost interest is what happened. I mean, I think that, again, um, uh, that was an aspiration, by the way, uh, not, a, not a prediction, uh, the new American century. But, but I think that what has happened, obviously, is uh, communism was, uh, I think, probably too much, but nevertheless, unquestionably, a huge motivating factor in American foreign policy. And it led to excesses and mistakes, but it also kept Americans engaged in the world even after, uh, you know, uh, failures in foreign policy. I mean, if you look at the difference between America, the way Americans responded after Vietnam, which was a much more uh, costly and even societally divisive war than Iraq, um, you know, within a few years, it's, they're electing Ronald Reagan and uh, building up the defense budget, and it's morning in America, and we have to fight the commies again. Um, we are now still in a post-Iraq, we never want to get out there and do that kind of thing again mode. Um, and by the way, I'm sure a lot of people think that's a wonderful thing, but I would say that the, when communism ended, the idea that there was anything that really required America to play an important role in the world just left for many Americans. And so that's what happened. And it's, as I said, it's a difficult thing to do. It's costly. It's unusual. I don't blame any country in the world for not wanting to do it. Most countries don't do it. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, that's what's happened, is the desire not to do it. So if you take the war in Afghanistan, should we, what should we do now? <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> I mean, um, you know, the only thing that I would say about Afghanistan is we, we understand how unhappy we are with the present situation, but we also need to understand how uh, unhappy we might be with the situation after uh, we've left the scene. And at this point, we're weighing two bad options, um, and it's really a question... By the way, this is true in foreign policy in general. You're always choosing between the bad and the worse, uh, not between the good and the bad. But in this case, the worse, it seems to me, is a return uh, to the Afghanistan of before. It means uh, a, a triumph of the Taliban, which has all kinds of implications for the rights uh, of women and, uh, and, and young and girls, and, and not to mention other, many other people. And I think it will inevitably invite a return of some group, whether it's al-Qaeda or, or uh, ISIS or something else, uh, using Afghanistan as a base. So, you know, it, it, it's very well to say, look at what a disastrous thing is. Uh, believe it or not, it could even be a bigger disaster. Right. No. Now, how about you? Let's bring a microphone to her. Um, during your remarks when you were speaking about uh, the American security guarantees in Europe and Asia, you said when America pulls out, not if. <laughs> so do you view it as inevitable that we are going to pull out? I think that... I don't know if that qualifies as a Freudian slip exactly, but um, uh, I, I, th I should have said if, but it's interesting that I said when. I mean, I do think that I don't rule out, um, whether in this term or in a second Trump term, uh, that he might in fact uh, say that we should pull out of NATO. Uh, from what I understand, he certainly has talks about this uh, privately. Um, and uh, so I, I, don't, I don't rule that out. And I also don't rule out the possibility that someday uh, we might uh, pull our troops out of Korea, for instance, as, as one example. And so, um, you know, right now I would say the trend is in that direction. We're not there yet. I hope we don't get there. I hope there's a reversal. Uh, but I would be lying if I didn't say that is kind of where things are moving right now. And one of the things that I find most troubling is that when the president does say things like, I don't, I don't want to say anything about Article 5 or why do we have to defend Montenegro or something like that, here in Washington, the foreign policy community starts pulling its hair out and gnashing its teeth and having a heart attack. The American public doesn't have that response. I don't sense among the American public any outrage or concern about any of that. I think if you said we were pulling our troops out of Europe tomorrow, the Washington foreign policy establishment would have a, a heart attack, and America would just say, fine. 
Um, that may be too pessimistic. Um, oh, and gosh, there are I, two, hope, I hope that is. There are two political parties. And by the way, if, if somebody, member of Congress were here, would say, aren't you paying attention to the fact that Congress keeps voting to keep us in NATO and, and, and doesn't let Trump do X, Y, and Z? And that's all true. But I, I, don't, I won't deny that my fear is that that is the trend that we're on right now. How about next, next the ambassador next to? Yes, Dr. Kagan. In your presentation, you spoke importantly about many trends that are uh, affecting us, especially in the realm of social media and so forth. But uh, there are a couple of trends that are obviously very important today. One is migration. Another is the globalization of production. Both of these things affect, uh, you might say, people's sense of belonging, belonging to a national group or whatever. And that's a third thing that's becoming evidently important. The quest in that globalized world of increasingly homogenizing populations or mixing populations for a sense of belonging. And one can see this in many countries of Europe, not just the ones that are straying in, in your terms from from uh, the path of liberal identity. But that kind of raises the question, doesn't it, of whether uh, the, whether a, say a nation's ability to regulate immigration or to resist bureaucratic encroachments from say an international organization or grouping that it's joined um, uh, are incompatible with authentically competitive democracy or the protection of individual rights, or someone's uh, ability to enjoy equal justice before the law. And isn't that kind of the crux of the matter, really? Is, so is your beef really with individuals like Viktor Orban, who govern in a particular way for a particular purpose, or is do you see an incompatibility between the modern quest for some identity amid those big forces and the liberal order that you were talking about? Well, it's a it's an it's an excellent question, and and it, and it's and it, the observation is certainly correct. And first of all, nations do have a right to regulate the flow of immigration into their borders. I don't know how anybody could say uh, that you should have open borders. That's just not the way nations have ever behaved. I think what you're seeing in the United States, just to take the the closest to home example, is uh, a pattern that you've seen throughout American history. There have been big waves of immigration. Uh, in the past, from you know, in the 1840s, uh, in the 1890s, and early 19th, uh, 19th century, no, early 20th century, uh, which have in turn led to backlashes against immigration. Whether it was the know nothing, the so-called know nothings of the 1850s, the highly restrictive immigration legislation of the 1920s, etc. And of course, there's, so there's nothing unusual in seeing that again. And there is nothing inherently illiberal or anti-liberal in in controlling immigration. So I think that that, is, that goes without saying. Um, where the problem comes uh, is not with that. And you, know, you, can then, you can then criticize Angela Merkel or somebody for opening up to too many Syrian refugees. The problem comes when from there you go to saying, and therefore we need to be a white nation. And, and, you know, in a place like Hungary, which ironically, by the way, has very few <laughs> immigrants, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, um, this idea of identity that you're talking about uh, is real. And then you have a, when you move to that stage, um, you're then in this territory where you do begin to encroach on liberalism in a way. So the question is, how do you balance the need to control immigration with this what it inspires, which is a, which is a genuinely anti-liberal sentiment. And you know, the United States is not, uh, this is a, an issue for the United States as well, and always has been. Uh, we have always had two competing ideas of nationhood. One that I think the founders talked about, which was a nationhood based entirely on the universal principles of the Declaration. But, but we've also had a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant nationhood. And much of the concern about immigration was not just the immigration, but as you say, our identity as a nation. And this has been a constant theme in our history. But, but the theme is one of our, our inherent liberalism as to be found in the Declaration and the desire 
of others to identify our nationhood with a certain political <coughs> and ethnic culture. And we're seeing that playing out right now. And that's where I, that's where I want to have the battle. I, I want to battle for the universal principles against the ethnic and cultural side of American nationalism. Uh, young lady in the back. Hi, um, my question has to do with how you think humanity is going to confront climate change. Um, so you said earlier that having control necessarily comes at an, a personal cost, whether that's moral or economic. Um, I'm wondering if you think a world power will step up and take the control in terms of confronting climate change, or is it possible in, with this world order and the retreat from liberalism to have government solve this problem? Great question. That is a great question. And, you know, I'd have to say, if you just said, look at human nature, I would say the odds are very bad that there is going to be some effective control by any nation or nations of the activities that, that we conduct on a daily basis that are contributing to, uh, to, to worsening the climate change situation. Um, what you're asking people to do, which I'm also asking them to do in foreign policy, is, is, is pay a certain price now uh, for to uh, to address a problem that you may not even uh, suffer from ultimately, and that is just something. I think if history tells you anything, that is just not something that human beings naturally do. Um, and I, by the way, even the countries that are most authoritarian today, like China, for instance, their attitude is you Western world went through your industrial revolution and polluted the world and brought us to where we are today and now you want us to constrain the building of our coal plants so that you don't, you know what I mean? And so it's very hard to do that. So, you know, I am, <laughs> I am on the one hand, uh, I want us to address this as much as we possibly can. I actually have, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not, I wouldn't say when you look at the Green New Deal that you know it, it sounds a little bit like pie in the sky, but I have to say I'm not entirely opposed to the to the jolt that it may give to the system uh, to try to do more, um, and and one can only hope. And then on the other hand, I am just praying for the technological fix that has in the past saved us from ourselves, but which may not. I, I can only hope it's going to save us again, but I have no faith in us, if that's the question you're asking. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, unfortunately, we've come pretty much to the end of our time, so uh, on a slightly dark note. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, we, uh, that's a cheerier question. Than the last <laughs> question no. uh, well, no, but, uh, but your, your message is a, worry, is a worried message overall, is it not? The book is a worried book. It's a worried book, and I mean, it, that doesn't even get into the fact that our tax policy makes no sense. And I mean, all the decisions we're making about our domestic affairs uh, is, is, is the same kind of jungle growing back in a way because it's all everybody looking out for themselves, which is uh, unfortunately all too normal. So um, uh, it's, it's, it's a dark message, but, I, but I will, let me just end on this. Yeah. I don't believe that there is such a thing as uh, uh, the determination that we of, of, that liberalism is determined, and that we're necessarily heading toward democracy. But I also be don't believe that liberalism's death is determined, and, and we are in a struggle. Uh, we are in a struggle on a lot of fronts, and all of us individually matter in a way that has not always been the case. And uh, you know, people of this generation knew they were in a struggle. I think we're just not used to thinking of ourselves in a struggle, but we are in one, again, on many planes. And I think it's time we started taking it all seriously. Don't give up hope, but realize how dark it is. <laughs> <laughs>I'm really glad I was here on this day to listen to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank thank we you all are. Uh, we're having a little reception outside, so those of you who can stay, please do. We'll see you out there. Thank you. <laughs>